Hey folks, welcome back for another episode of Code Club. As you have been following along, you know that we have been developing an R package to classify DNA sequences. Of course, if you know nothing about DNA sequences and don't really care to classify them, don't worry, stick around. There's still going to be a lot that you learn throughout this series about package development. We are getting into the final episodes of developing our package before we push it up to CRAN. In today's episode, I want to revisit some old code that I had written in C++, but I kind of mothballed. This C++ code was written using a package called RCPP, which is tremendously powerful for optimizing your code, right? So the first and most important thing in code is getting the right answer. Uh, second, or maybe even further down in the list, is getting it to run quickly. Many episodes ago, I showed uh, a variety of different ways that we could calculate some probability scores. And so this was involving some use of um, benchmarking of vectors and all sorts of other things. One of the things that I included there was C++ code. At the time, I was shocked to find that my C++ code actually ran quite a bit slower than the fastest code that I was able to write in pure R. Uh, I thought that was a little bit odd and I have been thinking about that ever since. Also, as we've been going through other episodes more recently, where we talk about linters and things like that, our linter is a bit upset that I have code behind a comment. Uh, and so I kind of turned off the linter so that uh, the linter wouldn't see those, right? The other thing uh, that I'm a bit annoyed by is that I have done a lot to do test-driven development to write my code after I write the test. And so I think my uh, code coverage was something like 70 or 80% when it should have been 100%. And that difference is because I have C++ code in my code base that's not getting used and isn't getting tested uh, because it's not getting called. And so what I wanna do in today's episode is revisit my RCPP code and see if we can't figure out why it is so slow and whether ultimately we should keep it or sadly remove it from our code base. So we'll head over to our studio and get going on today's work. If you wanna get your own copy of Kamers.R and the whole package as it currently stands, Go down below in the description, you'll see a link to the GitHub repository as it exists at this current commit. And then you'll also find down there a link to what the repository looks like at the end of the episode. Uh, no spoilers, don't jump ahead to see what we're going to do. Again, here we are in kamers.r. Kamers.r within the repository is located in the R directory, kamers.r there. And so the function that I am looking at is calc genus conditional prob. This is a function that goes into creating a database. This is currently the slowest part of uh, the overall <laughs> um, uh, pipeline of doing the classification. You can kind of see down here on line 201 that I have um, no lint start, and then it goes all the way down here to 225 with no lint end. And here are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different ways of calculating this probability. And what I finally decided upon was this version here. This is this code is fully vectorized, meaning that there's no for loops, nothing's going on except pure R code. I think underneath the hood, there are certainly for loops being used in uh, the C or C++ code that R is using to add together. Uh, I think these are both matrices. Maybe this one is a matrix and this one is a vector. Uh, and then genus count is also a vector. And so, Again, at the time, I don't know what data I was using. It was about 6.2 seconds, whereas my RCPP version was at about 10.3 seconds. And so, again, we also have all this other code that ultimately I'd like to clean this up and finally decide on one version that we're going to use. So let's go ahead and reinstantiate the benchmarking for all this. And so to do that, I will come back to my vignettes uh, directory here and I'll go into my vignette, phylotyper.rmd, and let's see where it has us in here. Um, so the very first step in this is this db equaling build camer database. So I'm going to do my benchmarking out of this vignette. Because I have everything under version control, I can always roll back the changes if I don't like what I have done, okay? So I'll start by setting the seed, um, and so we'll come down to this first code chunk. And previously I had used micro benchmark, uh, people in the comments have said, why don't you use bench? <laughs> so let's try bench and we'll see uh, how that works. I think for the most part, they're pretty similar. So I'll go ahead and do bench colon colon mark. And so you need to make sure that you have bench uh, installed 
and then we'll go ahead and close that with a um, closing parentheses. And then the argument to tell it how many times to run this function, this line up between 43 and 45, is called iterations. And I'll go ahead in here and put five. And so let's go ahead and let's load our package as it currently is using that R code. And we'll then go ahead and run that benchmarking and see how long it takes to do each iteration. So that comes back with a median time of 3.4 seconds per loop. Again, this is the slowest step. You would do this step once, and then you could classify all the sequences using this DB object. So this only needs to be generated once. Uh, so if you're doing like a thousand sequences, don't worry, it's not gonna take 3000 seconds. It's much faster to classify individual sequences. Regardless though, I still want to speed it up as much as possible. Just so we can see a difference between benchmark and micro benchmark, I'll go ahead and here and do micro benchmark, uh, micro benchmark. And I believe that the argument here is times instead of iteration. So I'll go ahead and run that and see how this compares in terms of output and what we like better or not. All right, so let me go ahead and expand this out. Now I'm only using five evaluations because it does take a bit of time to run and I don't wanna sit here waiting forever. Um, and so the, the precision on these numbers isn't super high, right? And so again, we're benchmarking the same uh, function. And so the median that I have using micro benchmark is 3.35 seconds, whereas up here it was 3.4. Um, I don't think that's, you know, a 10th of a, or even a, a 500th uh, of a second difference is not meaningful. And again, what we're looking at is kind of the, the difference in the types of output. Uh, the, the micro benchmark really focuses on time whereas bench also shows the memory allocation. So maybe I'll roll with bench and uh, we'll, we'll go back to using that for at least this episode. Okay, that way we'll get some of the speed uh, aspect of it. So again, this is the package loaded using the pure R code. Let's now go back and use our C++ code. So I'm gonna go ahead and comment this out. I'll dodge it over just a bit so that I remember which one it is. And then I'll come down to my C++ code, uncomment that, and then I'll go ahead and load that. And so this then loads the C++ version. So now we'll go ahead and repeat what we had done previously using the C++ code. All right, so that comes back and we see it takes about twice as long to run actually, right? So we're at a median of 6.36 seconds using the RCPP version, whereas the median before was like 3.4 seconds, right? So it's you know, almost uh, twice as long, right? And so again, that is surprising because we had done a whole bunch of benchmarking on our C++ code to get it to be as clean as possible. Uh, let me take you down to that. That's in the SRC directory here. And, and here then you'll see the kmers.cpp file. This was the beautiful C++ code that I worked very hard to try and optimize and didn't end up being any faster, right? And so that's a bit disconcerting. Now. One thing that I noticed um, as I was kind of looking around on the internet is that when you compile C++ code in kind of this environment as we're building the package and developing the package, it's actually being compiled in a debug mode. So the debug mode allows you to use the debugger, debugger, <laughs> I'm a Midwesterner here, debugger, um, to kind of step through and look for problems in your code. And because of that, the debugger uh, causes your code to run slower than it normally would, okay? And so one of the things that I would like to do is show that to you. And so to show it to you, I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of these .o files. These are also called DLL files. And so I can delete those manually, or I could do pkg uh, build colon colon clean underscore DLL, run that, and then if I refresh the screen in the lower right, I see those .o files go away, okay? So again, let's go ahead and load our package. And because those DLL files are gone, it will now recompile uh, my source code. And as you can see, I've got those .o files back. And now let's actually look <laughs> at this code that gets spat out to us that usually I just gloss over. And so one of the things I'll notice immediately is that it says recompiling phylotyper debug build, right? Ah, all right. And so one thing I notice when I look at these individual uh, compilation lines where it's building those .o files 
is that there are these flags, as they're called. So the dash O is the level of optimization, okay? And so I see a dash O zero, but within the same statement earlier, there's a dash O two, right? So the dash O two, or perhaps a dash O three, is what I'm more used to seeing when I compile C++ code. So the two or the three is the level of optimization that is used, okay? The zero is no optimization, and that is used for debugging. Um, and so again, what's going on in the optimization is kind of looking for things like memory leaks, as they're called, um, kind of going beyond the index in a vector, uh, it has a number of different checks that are being used in dash O zero that aren't being used in the dash O two. You can imagine doing those extra checks. It's going to take longer. If you remove those checks, it goes faster, but it's kind of like removing the guardrails. When things go bad, they could go really bad. What I have learned is that the second flag for optimization takes precedent over the first flag, right? And so we are using dash O zero optimization. Okay. So let's go ahead and we have this loaded. Let's go ahead and rerun the benchmarking to make sure that we're still up around uh, six seconds with this version of the RCPP compiled in dash O optimization or in that debug mode. So sure enough, it is still in the six and a half second median execution time range. Um, one thing I think I forgot to mention was this trainset nine PDS comes with the package, okay? So uh, I'm not magically pulling that up, but that is built uh, as part of uh, the file type or package as a built-in data set. Okay, so this again is in the debug mode. How do we get out of the debug mode? So there's at least two ways that I know of to do this. So first, let's go ahead and remove those DLL files. So again, we'll do pkg build and clean DLL. We can confirm that those .o files have gone away. And then we'll use another pkg build function um, that is going to be compile DLL. Oh, and I got to spell it right. Compile DLL. And you'll notice that the very last argument in this yellow pop up is debug equals true. So let's go ahead and do debug equals false. So we'll run that. So again, if we refresh our lower right screen, we now see those dot O files. And if we come back to the output from compiling those files, we see that we no longer have that debug mode listed that we had previously when we compiled this. And then when we look at an individual file getting compiled, I see the dash O2, but I don't see that dash O0 anymore, telling me that this has been compiled in release mode. It turns out uh, that CRAN, the repository for all R packages, will use the dash O2 compile flag. So while there is a dash O3, that you can use to compile C++ code. Uh, there's no benefit for doing that because when it's finally compiled uh, on CRAN, it's not gonna be used. So now let's go ahead and redo the benchmarking using the dash O2. So we'll run this and we'll see if we come up at 6.5 seconds, 3.5 seconds like the pure R version, or hopefully uh, perhaps even faster. So it came back at 6.5 seconds and I'm remembering that I forgot to load the package. So I'll go ahead and load the package and rerun that benchmark. So that did end up being a lot faster than the previous RCPP version that was previously again at like six and a half seconds. The pure R version was at about 3.3, 3.4 seconds. Here we're at about 3.2 seconds. I really don't think that two hundredths of a second difference is really that meaningful. Um, one of the other challenges with using C++ code is you have to maintain it. <laughs> um, and uh, there's all sorts of things that go into compiling a R package that make things perhaps a little bit harder for your end user. It makes installation a little bit slower. Um, and again, it just, it makes it harder to interface with. It makes it harder to maintain and get people to help you to maintain that R code. So. I'm not convinced that I need to change away from using the C++ version. So again, this was using the non-debug uh, compiling conditions, but you might also want another way to do the same thing without having to worry about all this DLL stuff and setting uh, things not to be in debug mode. So a natural way to get out of debug mode is to actually install your package. And so we can go ahead into the upper left corner of our build tab and I'm gonna go ahead and do the clean and install. 
This then builds and installs FileTyper in my local R session, and it also goes ahead and does a library FileTyper on it. If I come back up through the dialog here for the installation, I'll see the C++ compilation message, right? And again, you'll notice that I have that dash O2 and none of that dash O0. Let's go ahead now and rerun our benchmarking. Again, this is using the C++ code built into my R package rather than the pure R version. So that gets us at about three seconds. Thinking about it while it was running for those 15 seconds, I think I'm going to go ahead and up this to, um, let's go ahead and do 100 iterations. So we'll get better precision on the amount of time it takes to run this, and then we'll repeat it using the pure R version. All right, so that ran with 100 iterations, and we see that it took a median of about three seconds. Awesome. I'm now going to go back into the code and we'll go ahead and go back to the pure R version by commenting out the C++ version and then coming up here to comment that out. I'll go ahead and save it. And then we'll also do a new install. So of course that installed, you'll notice that there is some output in here from C++, but that's because the C++ code is still in the package, even though we aren't using it. And so again, if we come back to our terminal, it has restarted the R session. It went ahead and did library FileTyper for me. I'm gonna go ahead and rerun this again with 100 iterations and see how it compares to that three second median time. So that completed running. Again, it did 100 iterations. This is the pure R version. And we can see that the median execution time across those 100 iterations was 3.2 seconds compared to the three seconds that we had using the RCPP version. The only thing I noticed is that the memory allocated by R to the C++ version was 2.88 gigabytes. Again, this data set that we're putting in as a reference is quite large, um, whereas it's about 3.87 gigabytes using the pure R version. As I looked back through previous uh, runs of this benchmarking, I saw that distinction again, where the C++ version is using about one gigabyte less, or maybe a quarter of the memory as the pure R version. I think I'm going to go ahead and roll with the C++ version um, and I'll be happy with that. So let's go back to our source code now. So I'm gonna go ahead and roll with this C++ version and I'll delete all this other stuff. If I ever wanna come back and find uh, the R code that I had before, I have it in my version control. So I'll say this calls a RCPP uh, version of the function, okay? So go ahead and save that. So I'll come back to my RMD file and I'm gonna go ahead and undo to remove all these changes. And then if I look at my Git tab uh, and refresh, I see I only have the R uh, kmers.r file that I have modified. So to test the coverage, I'll go ahead and use the cover package and we'll do it in do package uh, coverage. So as I started running that, I recalled I hadn't loaded the package. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and load the package again using DevTools load all. And then again, I'll run that package coverage from the cover package. Wonderful, that ran through without any errors, warnings, or notes. Always good to see. Let's head over to the terminal and see if we can't commit this. We'll do a git status, right? We only have the one file that's been modified. I'll do git add rkmers.r, do another git status just to double check. And we'll do git commit. And then we'll do commit to using our CPP version of prob calculator, All right? Again, it's gonna run through the pre-commit checks. So this failed on my linter and um, it's saying, let's see, the object usage linter, no visible global function definition for calculate log probability. This is my C++ function um, and Pretty sure that's being exported. Let me go down to source and then my kmers.cpp. Um, and yeah, it's sure enough, it's being exported. So I'm not super worried about that. Oh, it's a bit risky, but I think I'm going to turn off that linter. So if I come back to dot linter, and then in here, I can then take um, object usage linter and do that equals null. Uh, and that should turn off the linter. So I'll go ahead and do that. 
And then I'll do get status on that. I'll go ahead and stage uh, both of these. I think it made a modification to my kmers.r script. So I'll do git add dot linter r kmers.r. And now I'll redo the commit message and hopefully that error message will go away. So this is always a bit of iteration. And we see that the unstaged changes to dot linter file, I had staged them. So maybe it modified things. Yeah, that didn't change anything. Uh, ah, this is more than I bargained for. I'm gonna go ahead and unstage my rkamers.r and then commit my dot linter file. So let's go ahead and do git restore staged dot linter. Oh, gotta spell it right. <laughs> I unstaged the wrong thing. I'm getting tired. Git restore staged uh, rkamers.r. Okay, let's check things out and start over. So we'll git add dot linter status, good, git commit dash m, ignore uh, object usage linter. Okay, that all passed. Git status, cool, git add our uh, kmers, good. And then I'll come back through, let's use this commit message. I see the problem is with the linter is not happy with the format of my linter file. Uh, and so I think I need to have the close parenthesis there. Ah, okay, git add dot linter. This was probably the problem from before. So we'll do git status and then recommit. So it's really finicky. Ah, I don't know what's going on. So I'll go ahead and do a git uh, restore staged on our uh, kmers. R. Let's go ahead and use that commit message from earlier. That's all good. Get add our kmers.r. Get status, good. And then we'll rerun that git commit. <sighs> Finally, <laughs> it didn't pass, <laughs> but it liked our linter uh, file and it got rid of that uh, error that it gave us before. I'm gonna have to do some digging because it does make me feel a little bit uneasy to get rid of that object usage linter um, because I don't trust myself to always find all the problems at the same time. Um, I think some of this is actually being checked when you do uh, check under build. So we'll roll with that. All right, so what is it complaining about now? Well, this is an old problem, but line 203 is too long. So we'll come back to Kamers uh, and sure enough, yeah, we see that this just goes off the right side. I'll go ahead and add some line breaks in here so that it all fits on one side. Get status, we have to add that modification, get add our kmers.r, get status, good. And then we'll go ahead and recommit it and hopefully this will pass. So everything passed, but I don't have a clean commit status. So I'll do get status and it must have changed something. So I'll do get diff on our kmers.r um, and I think it moved over my arguments. So we'll do git add on rkmers.r. Again, this is very iterative, doing it till we get it right. And we trust that it does make our code better, readable, less buggy. Um, at least that's the hope, right? So that worked, we're to green. And if we do git status, everything is good. We'll go ahead and do a git push to get that up onto GitHub and hopefully get that badge. So we've got our brown circle here telling us that there's a bunch of GitHub actions all in process here. This test coverage is the one we're most interested in. Um, of course, we wanna make sure everything still builds properly on the different platforms. Uh, and so if you scroll down here to the readme, you'll see that we have this code cov badge, which was 93%. I think I maybe said 80 or 70%. It's at 93%. But with this change, it should certainly go up to 100% now. This is gonna take a little bit of time as we've seen in the past. And so I'll check back and show you what our badge is at. So that completed running. I got the green check on all of those GitHub actions coming down to my readme. So I see I'm at 99%, which is better than 93, but still isn't 100. Um, not super worried about it, of course. If I scroll into this, I can see that yeah, it's still in my C++ code. The kmers.cpp is at 90% coverage. Um, and that for some reason, it is not liking this or it's saying it's not covered. 
Um, ultimately, I'm not really super concerned about it. I certainly don't want to take any more of your time to figure out why this isn't counting. But um, I think we're in good shape, like I said, um, and be happy that we're effectively at 99%, like a rounding error, one line. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not super concerned. Again, we are marching our way through the final steps of getting our Phylotyper package ready to push up to CRAN. Join me for the next episode where we'll do a little bit more code development to follow up on a couple of issues that I've identified as I've been playing with the package myself. So you don't miss that episode. Please make sure that you subscribe to the channel and I'll see you next time for another episode of Code Club.